Hi, and welcome to the Cornelius Seed Podcast. Thank you for checking out our podcast. Established in 1935, we're an American-owned and family-owned independent seed company. And we're excited to partner with you in our new podcast by bringing you five generations of agricultural experience and decades of industry expertise. In our podcasts, you can expect to gain valuable and timely information to aid you in making decisions for your operation. We'll keep things simple and informative and much like our motto, Planet Profit. Welcome back to the Cornelius Seed Podcast. I'm Juan Camacho, Cornelius Seed Innovation Lead, and I'm joined by Craig Alleman, our lead agronomist. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Juan. Well, let's jump right in. I know things are we're finally cutting loose for planting season across Cornelius country, and it's been a challenging spring. First the cold, then the wet with all the moisture. So what's the prognosis for seed that's been planted in, in some of those earlier windows and for any new seed that's been going into the ground or is yet to go in? Well, I can say uh, at the end of this week, I feel pretty darn good about everything. Um, of course, we were very apprehensive as the late start we were getting across the, you know, across the Corn Belt, across certainly across Cornelius country. Um, we did, get, you know, some areas that we did get some earlier stuff in, um, but really early this week, things started cutting loose. I know there is still a, a few areas that are a bit wet, but I think we, you know, some of those areas were pushing it and getting going just with the calendar. Um, you know, on a normal, normally in, end of April, first of first of May plantings, um, it'll take a couple of weeks anyway for, for corn to emerge um, and beans maybe a little bit quicker. But, uh, you know, some of that stuff that was planted in mid-April um, probably took at least three weeks to get out of the ground because we had some pretty cool conditions. And, you know, growing, growing degree units um, is what it takes to get, to get corn emergence and uh, usually takes about 125 GDUs to get that corn out of the ground. Um, about mid, mid-week this week, um, you know, that stuff that had been planted a couple weeks is starting to come up. That 90-degree temperatures that we had just kind of kind of shot it right out of the ground. But this stuff that, that was put in this week, you know, I would look, I would look at maybe five, six days and we'll have some, we'll have some corn and beans emerging in, in this, in this kind of heat. Wow. So what we're getting to is I don't think that we've lost a lot of time. Um, and this window was, took forever to get here, but uh, once it got here, it looks like it's going to be a, a fabulous one because we're, we're going to get this crop out of the ground really quickly. Um, we really probably are not very far behind that stuff that was planted, uh, say that third week in in April. So that that's very positive. This will probably end up being our best planting window, um, just because the crop went in uh, is going to come up pretty rapidly, and uh, that's always a good thing to get you know to blow out of the ground and get by some of those soil borne um, diseases that we can get early on in corn and in beans. Um, and I have seen. I have seen some soybeans that have that were planted uh, untreated uh, in this particular case that probably have uh, looks like maybe some pythium damage on them um, would have been in cool wet soils and not not having that uh, fungal fungicide seed treatment um, is always a, a tough situation. So, you know, those are the things that we normally have to look at. But with these with these warm conditions, uh, we're probably going to escape a lot of that this year. So I think as apprehensive as we were with the with the season getting along, um, it looks like we're going to have a pretty fabulous window with good soil moisture underneath this crop. Um, I think we're going to be off to a pretty darn good start. So we'll see what the rest of the, the year's weather brings to us. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's really good to hear. We, you touched a little bit on soybeans that some naked, some untreated soybeans that um, went into some of that wet, cooler ground and affected by pythium. I know there are some areas um you know, obviously that were wet for a while and, and, I, and some guys that um, had to push it for a little bit, you know, where most of the field was good, but there would have been some marginal areas uh, for corn specifically. Is, is there kind of anything that a guy's going to have to watch out for um, as they're scouting or checking fields? Well, I know, you know, we get to, we always get to that point where that field is 90% good uh, or 90% very good, you know, and then we've got those marginal, you know, maybe those wet holes that, that are always there. And, uh, you know, when the, 
when the calendar gets a little later, we just need to go and we, and we, we kind of blow through those areas. So, you know, your soil conditions are perfect. Things are going well. And then you're going to slice through some of that uh, wet soil and you'll, you'll probably get some sidewall compaction. Uh, um, and then that dries out under these kind of warm conditions and, and you get a hard, hard sidewall there and your roots a lot of times they'll have that tomahawk effect. Um, you know, where they're just going to go grow straight down. They're not able to penetrate through, penetrate through that sidewall. They might break through there. Uh, probably the only thing, if you've got big areas that you can really do to alleviate that is maybe, um, maybe get out there and run the rotary hoe, you know, to kind of bust, try to bust some of that up a little bit, help those roots get, get established out through there. But hopefully those are not large areas. Um, if they are, you, uh, you may consider, uh, may consider running that rotary hoe out there. And then, you know, I, I touched based on, on soybeans and, and, um, I know there's been some pretty good studies. Uh, I think very quality studies come out and showing that there's not, you know, over time, there's not a great advantage to, um, to seed treatments, but I think in particular the fungicide portion of that, <clears throat> you know, we, d we do that like we do a lot of things for an insurance purpose as much as anything. And, you know, your seed treatments, um, your seed treatments maybe don't pay for their themselves until the year that they do. Um, and, and, and I think that this is a good example, um, you know, where we've stuck those soybeans into cool, wet soils and, and we put them in an environment for extended period of time where things like pythium um, are going to are going to be able to attack that seed. And, and so if you don't maybe you don't return that investment every year, but I think over time you, it, it's still a very solid uh, a practice that we uh, that we try to do. No, that that makes sense. That's something really good to keep in mind. Uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, and and well, we we're just talking about you know wet soils, and but obviously this here this last week, um, you know, I'd say I'd call it the week after uh, Mother's Day. It's it's crazy that last year we were talking about a Mother's Day freeze, and this year we're talking about um, heat warnings and, and ninety plus degree heat across most of Cornelius country. Uh, so so with that heat while well, we got that water bed up right before and the heat kind of quickly dried up some soils uh some of the questions we've been getting in is is how deep should uh should guys be planting guys and gals be planting and in, in to dry dirt well um you probably do need to get off your planter in these kind of conditions and and uh check things a little more often than normal i mean we we have this habit of getting this perfect planting depth and and we have that written down uh, what our settings on the planter are but um you know we we often think about changing those if we get into uh tighter soils uh, maybe we go from conventional tillage to um we really need to pay attention this year if our soils are getting dried out and and uh, you, when you have 90 degrees and 40 mile an hour winds like we've had some some of these days um, that's going to dry out pretty quickly so it's better to get that seed put into moisture, um, even if you've got to go down a little bit deeper to, to get to that. And I certainly wouldn't be afraid to go, um, you know, three inches deep if I needed to, to, to chase moisture with that, with that corn seed. Um, you know, I like to plant my sweet spot personally is about two and a quarter inches. And, uh, but I, I, uh, be a bit afraid to chase that at least, at least down to three, even a little bit more. You're only talking in these kind of warm conditions, you're only talking maybe a day, a day and a half more to get that corn emerged if it's a, an additional inch, you know, under these conditions. So, um, you don't have to really worry about that, but if you're setting in dry soil and we start missing these rains, um, then that's not a good deal. That's not a good situation to be in. Okay. Well, that's, uh, a good segue into, you know, and situations that are not good to be in, right? So, so this week we've gotten some spectacular and awesome uh, uh, days with the planting days and some good heat units out there. Um, next week we're going to transition to into actually what spring should probably feel like. Uh, what are some just some early season watchouts that that um, that we should kind of keep uh, in, in, on the top of our head as as we go through the season and, and it progresses. Well, you start thinking about insects and, and at this time of the year in particular, um, Iowa State does a good job with their uh, moth trapping program. 
Um, so if you've looked at those maps and updated them, I think the thing that stands out is they're, they're trapping moss for uh, black cut worm and then also for true army worm. And so if you look at their maps, you'll see that sporadically and they don't have uh, traps in every county in Iowa. So if you look at it and as sporadically as you see some of those numbers spiking up, I think the message is, is that we all need to be scouting our fields um, no matter what the maps say, because, um, you know, we could have a problem and five miles down the road, our neighbors are fine. Uh, those moths come up, uh, fly up from the south and they come up in storms a lot of times and it, there's no real predicting on where they're going to be. But they are going to be attra attracted to trash or to residue um, <clears throat> because you just think about if it's a if it's windy and you're a moth and you're coming in, you want to land on a bare soil or do you want to land on some uh, foliage or, or some some residue that you can grab onto and then that's when they're they'll be laying those eggs so um, <clears throat> if you, you know when you get done planting um, and that corn is is uh, you know a few inches tall uh, that's time to be out there it's a good time to be out there anyway doing stand counts and um, you know, making sure that we don't have issues uh, with diseases or anything else, but that's when you're going to be looking for your black cutworm. So, you know, over the next two to three weeks until that corn's uh, probably at least a foot tall, um, and we kind of get by that stage where it's going to affect us, um, that's when we're out there on, and hopefully on a four wheeler. Uh, it's, the, in my opinion, the by far the best way in the spring because you're you're not going to cover the whole field if you're getting out there and walking. You're just going to go out there and and uh, and do a short distance, but get on that four wheeler and make sure you zigzag through that field and get a good, get a good scout of it. <clears throat> and uh, you might be surprised at some of the things you learn, uh, you know, what your planters do on what your weed pressure's like, but also then you'll catch that damage from the, from the black cutworm before it's too late and you get in there and spray with a rescue spray. But <clears throat> one of the bigger things I think um, is we get more and more um, cereal rye that we're planting into and I think in most cases we're planting soybeans into it. Um, I've seen a ton of that this year. Um, I think it's a good practice uh, that some of that cereal rye is getting up to foot tall. Guys are terminating it with Roundup and then coming in and planting beans right into it. And that that uh, thatch of that cereal rye is acting as a good good way to um, uh, reduce some weed emergence emergence uh, here early in the season. Um, but that, that's a perfect place when the, when the true army worm moths are flying north. That's a perfect place for them to come in and lay their eggs. And I, I've seen soybeans come up and just get annihilated, uh, completely destroyed by, um, by the true army worm. So you really need to be out there. And, and that, you know, that, that's a pest that can just do it in a day or two. So you need to be out there pretty consistently until you're, you're confident that you buy that on, the, on those particular fields. So would you say that, you know, in the last podcast, we kind of, we briefly touched base on, um, you know, folks planting into green, it, it, anybody that would have been in that situation, is it safe to assume, you know, you, you just highly encourage being out there probably more than you normally would scouting it? Yeah, because you just, you've just created an environment that, that's going to be uh, going to host, uh, you know, some, some pests that you normally wouldn't uh, be concerned about. So, okay. uh, I mean, Along with a new program comes some new management techniques that you need to just incorporate into your system. Oh, well, that makes sense. It, uh, I'm not sure if it's if it's, uh, it's too early in the season, or maybe you might have uh, an update. But you kind of already touched on it. But as a whole, insect pressure. Um, what what kind of forecast update do you do you have if you were to gaze into the crystal ball or some of the studies that you would keep an eye on? Well, definitely too early to get any kind of handle on what's going on right now. Um, I know the eggs are hatching for the aphids, but we don't have any indication on pressure. Um, I, th I think probably the biggest thing just from last year is we, we had a just a huge outbreak of uh, corn rootworm across, you know, particularly across north, the northern half of Iowa and into northwest Illinois and southwest Wisconsin. And so we know, you know, we know that that pest was there and they they lay their eggs in the soil and over winter. And, um, you know, those larva end of May, first of June are going to be hatching out. So the month of June is when our feeding is, is going to be occurring. So, um, you know, we need to be, 
uh, you, you, you've already done what you can do, uh, either through an insecticide or planting a smart stacks corn or something similar. So, but, but this is the time that you would monitor what kind of feeding you would get, you know, in the month of June coming up. And then uh, you will have to be making decisions if you've got an outbreak about, uh, you know, spraying adult beetles so that they don't clip silks. And then later on, am I going to spray those adult beetles to uh, try to kill them before they lay their eggs, you know, as a, as a beetle bomb approach to that system. So that's probably the biggest one that we're going to watch out for because we know it's, uh, it was such an issue last year and, and we expect that to continue this year. Okay. Well, it, it, um, I'd hate to be a broken record, but it, it definitely sounds like, you know, you, you've, you've got to scout and stay on top of it. Right. And, uh, especially when you take into, you know, what we saw last year and, and even some of the conditions this year where, where we had that compacted planting season that, that, you know, it's a different variable. Um, is there any, anything else that someone should be scouting for now, or is it, you know, this, let's wait till the season progresses just a little bit more. Well, the biggest thing right around the corner is going to be your, you know, your, uh, what kind of weed control you're getting out of your residual herbicides. And, uh, you know, now that we've got warm conditions, a lot of those are going to be germinating. And I, I noticed, uh, <clears throat> we knocked down the end rows for the sprayer guys and, and maybe we didn't do the greatest job of getting back right to the edge of the field, uh, right before we planted. And we're already having some, you know, some early flushes of grass in that outside two or three feet, if we didn't get it, uh, hit again with the, with the soil finisher. So, um, you know, dry conditions can be tough, can be a challenge for the herbicide to be activated in. And so we could have some weed escapes through there. And then that, that just kind of dis- determines maybe when you'll timing wise, when you'll spray your post application, or if I do need to change rates or, or, uh, herbicides there. But I think, I think, uh, you know, related to what we were just talking about with corn rootworm too, and this, and this delayed planting season and the coolness we've had to, you know, the rootworm larva will hatch depending, again, on it's a growing degree thing. Um, so as cool as it's been in the, in this spring, we could probably see a delayed hatch on that as well. Um, don't know that that's anything other than interest, um, but, you know, a lot of times our hatch will, that determines on when the, when the beetles, the adult beetles are going to be out and clipping silks and everything. So, um, getting planted a little bit later, maybe soaking a week or so later, but it looks like our, our rootworm larva uh, might might come out a little later too. So that's probably gonna it's probably gonna coincide at the same time there. And and when we had dry conditions last fall, uh, we get big cracks in the soil. A lot of times those uh, adult beetles will go down and lay their eggs deeper, and that gives us a a uh, a delayed hatch as well as far as time frame it's going to extend that hatch period instead of over a week or so it might be over two or three weeks and uh, that's also going to leave them out there um, hitting that silk you know pretty much catch everything that uh, is soaking so I, i'd say that that's the number one pest we're going to need to watch and give them a lot of attention when we're um, when we're out there looking at corn and it's soaking okay good well craig um that's all I had on my neck of the woods in terms of kind of questions that had come in. Uh, that had come in. Uh, is there anything that we may have missed that uh, you think is uh, timely to talk about? No, I don't think agronomically wise, but it's always just fun to step back and watch the American farmer at work. And I'm just always so impressed at how quickly we can cover acres collectively as a as an industry. Um, you know, just li- literally almost a planter in every field and. I, I'm interested to see uh, next Monday's report and see the planning progress. I, I I would think it would almost be a record across the Corn Belt because we had such a big area that was delayed and it kind of all got going at once. And uh, it's just impressive. It makes me proud to be part of it. And uh, it's really fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just resilient and adaptable and wouldn't have it any other way. Um, thank you for your time, Craig. Folks, thank those of you that joined us for listening. Thank you uh, for your time as well. If you have any questions or we, uh, you'd like for us to touch base on on something else on future podcasts, uh, don't hesitate to send us a note or talk to your local seed rep or your local district sales manager. Um, send us an email. You can get a hold of us through uh, 
you know, Facebook and uh, our website. Uh, you know, we're still in that planting season, so uh, be safe and happy planting.